Historical Society of Palm Beach County. And today we're with Rand Hawk at 400 North Flagler Drive. Good afternoon, Rand. Good afternoon, Debbie. Would you please say your full name and spell it for us? My name is Rand Hawk, and the first name is spelled R-A-N-D. The last is spelled H-O-C-H. Do you not have a middle name? I do not. I was born in Everett, Washington, out on the West Coast. How much? I, I never would have thought that you were from the West Coast. I only stayed there a few months. My dad was working on a project out there. We come from New England, and shortly after I was born, got transferred back to Massachusetts. What did, what, tell me your parents' names. Uh, my dad is Harold Hawk. My mother uh, is Thelma Hawk. They both passed. Siblings? I have two brothers, uh, both older, David and Stephen. Do they live here in Florida? Or uh, in David lives here in West Palm Beach, and Stephen is in Washington State. Washington State, lovely. So, where did you grow up? Small town north of Boston called Swampskit, Massachusetts. It's a name shortened from some Indian language, it means at the shore of the Red Rock, and founded in the 1620s by disgruntled Puritans. Very historic and beautiful, could walk to five beaches, good place to grow up, great education. That's, I was going to say, it sounds like a perfect place to grow up. But cold in the wintertime. <laughs> Very cold. So you made a wise decision after you left school to move further south. There was a blizzard in 1978 that people from Massachusetts still remember. That was the reason I moved to Florida. Where did you go to school? Uh, I went to public schools in uh, Swampscott. Uh, then uh, I graduated. My undergraduate work was at Georgetown in Washington, D.C. And when I decided later to go to law school, I went to Stetson here in Florida on the West Coast. Why law? Growing up, I was constantly arguing with people about things. Uh, so I heard, you should become a lawyer all of the time. And I decided it probably was a good thing to do. There's a lot of power uh, with knowledge of the law, a lot of things that you can do to help people. So it sort of was a natural transition. I did take five years off between undergrad and law school so I could do what I really wanted to do, and that was become a Florida beach bum. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Where were you in the Florida Beach Bum? Uh, I started out in St. Pete and then moved to Daytona Beach. Why did you choose St. Pete? I chose St. Pete because that was where I had uh, access to computer systems that I needed for the job that I had. So, and then I just ended up staying there for a while. What job did you have? I was a political consultant. I had done a lot of work in D.C., had my own firm. And then when I decided to move to Florida, I got a call from a friend of mine saying, have I got a client for you? So I came down and did some work for him for a few months and didn't really need to work for the rest of the year. So off to the beach and had some friends there and it was a good time. So did you get him elected? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, uh, after doing research for about Four months, I told him if he ran for office and he was running for sheriff and the election were held today, he would get 8% of the vote. A year and a half later, he got 8% of the vote. Totally coincidental, but I decided after that uh, polling, it really wasn't a good position for me to be in. Plus, I wasn't happy in the middle of the state. I've always been by the water. I need to walk to the beach, ride my bike to the beach. So St. Pete made sense. Okay. Then you moved on to Daytona Beach, much closer to the beach. Much closer to the beach, uh, literally uh, a block away. And what did you do in Daytona? Uh, I moved to Daytona because the friend who had got me the first job uh, was thinking of running for Congress. He ended up running for the legislature, ultimately was a county commissioner there. So I moved uh, for that but since he kept changing what he wanted to do, I went into real estate. So I became a real estate sales associate, eventually opened up a real estate brokerage. 
This was at a time where mortgage rates were about 15%. So it was more or less in line with my being a beach bum. I was the barefoot broker of Ormond Beach. I was on the beach a lot, and I had an incredible tan. I was going to say, that had to be the early 80s. That was uh, late 70s, early 80s, yeah. yes. Yes, Nothing was moving in residential real estate. No, not, not really. And if you were trying to buy, the rate, rates were about 18%. We were told to tell people, forget about the interest rates, just can you make the monthly payment. Interesting concept. That is an interesting concept. I'm going to start that over because of that comment. All right. So what finally led you to, to law school? Well, I was always involved in politics growing up. Uh, I had been involved with the movement to lower the voting age. And in Massachusetts, we did it before the constitutional amendment was uh, approved. As a matter of fact, when they signed the law uh, into effect, I was in the governor's office as a 10th grader with about a dozen other people, and everyone's going, who's the kid? But we organized in our community, in our little town of Swampscott, we knocked on doors and we gathered more signatures to get this on the ballot than the entire city of Boston. So we were extremely motivated to change the world. A lot of us had older brothers who were of draft age, uh, which was a concern. This was the time of the anti-war movement. So that's how I first got involved uh, in politics and trying to change the laws. And again, arguing with a lot of people, trying to convince them that this was the right thing to do. Ultimately, law school was the answer. And did you follow a particular path in law school? It was, it was funny. Um, I had been a real estate broker, as I mentioned. So I took my real estate courses, did very well. I had background. I had all sorts of experience. So I figured that was the path I should go to because I was borrowing every last dime to go to law school. And I needed to be able to pay those loans back. So real estate seemed to be the way to go. So during my second year of law school, I had a clerkship with a law firm in North Palm Beach doing real estate law. And they seemed to like my work. And I just assumed that they knew I was gay. When I negotiated for the position, I said, I need to take two weeks off in the middle of the summer so I can go to San Francisco for the Democratic National Convention. Those conventions last four days. Uh, there were partners there, male partners who wore earrings. There was a partner in his 40s with a roommate who was a hairdresser. So I figured it was one of these, don't ask, don't tell, everything's cool. So at the end of the summer, uh, and I really didn't like real estate law. At the end of the summer, they wrote out a $1,000 bonus check, which they gave me, which was a lot of money back then for bonus check. And they offered me a job. And I'm thinking during this process, how many years am I going to have to do boring real estate law till I can do something that's more interesting? But I asked the partner, I said, how many, oh, well, I, I, let me get this straight. So I asked the partner, how is my being gay going to affect my becoming a partner years down the road? And I watched all of the color drain out of his face and all of the color rush back into his face, and he said these words, we've never had that problem before. So I'm sitting there with a $1,000 check in my pocket going, please get me out of here before the bank closes. I want to cash this. I do not want to deposit this. Uh, and we talked, and he said, we will discuss with the partners. We've got a retreat coming up. Well, leading up to the retreat, there were notices posted throughout the law firm that said, if you want to bring a significant other, let us know and you can bring your significant other. The day after the interview, a memo went out that said, only spouses. So no one knew why except for me and of course the managing partners. I took that again as not a very good sign. So they said, well, let's just sort of keep this offer on hold now 
and see what we can do. I said, you understand, I'm going to have to go back to law school. One of the few people was actually offered a job right away. And I'm going to have to interview with other firms who are going to say, why didn't you go to work for the firm that you clerked for? And they said, well, we'll deal with it. So a couple of weeks went by. They didn't deal with it at all. So I called a managing partner and I said, we have a problem here. I'm starting interviews because I need to work. And I want to tell them the truth that you offered me a job and I declined. And I don't have to go into detail about why I declined or anything like that. It actually was a negotiation with this law firm for me to tell the truth about what happened. So I switched my interest from real estate law to employment law and civil rights law. So in the last year of school, I took every labor law course available. I wrote uh, papers on discrimination against gay people by the federal government. There was a lot of new case law around. I also came across a case that uh, decided that you actually could be openly gay and a lawyer here in Florida. That had to be decided by the courts. And the one question they didn't ask the, um, the plaintiff at the trial was whether he actually engaged in gay sex or just was gay. So part of the time I'm in law school, I'm sitting there going, am I actually going to be able to become a lawyer? Uh, fortunately, I became a lawyer. DeSantis Cook, Gaskell, and Silverman. Okay. Is now, still in business? the good thing is. It was DeSantis? Yeah, uh, yeah not, not like okay. Ron DeSantis. Okay. Um, but the good thing is, when I came back and I was at court one day, I saw one of the partners, uh, and he said, I'm kind of surprised that um, you, know, you came back to Palm Beach County. He said, That's the reason I came back to Palm Beach County. I'm going to work on laws to make sure no one can discriminate against people based purely on their sexual orientation. And he kind of smiled and he said, good for you. Years later, I mediated for the firm and when they celebrated their 25th anniversary, I got an invitation that said, Rand Hawk and guest. How so wonderful. progress was made. Yes. But at the time, what they did was perfectly legal because there were no protections for LGBTQ plus people anywhere in Florida. Sorry to interrupt. Do, do y'all hear that noise? It sounds like the air conditioner or? It's, or it's uh, my wine cellar. Oh, gotcha. So, okay. Right, no Can't do anything about it. Can't leave that. It's right. the wine cellar is what you said? Right. Okay. 596 bottles of carefully selected wines being coddled at the right temperature. And, uh, and humidity. As long as we don't get hit by a hurricane, right? Right, that's my biggest fear now that I can't insure them anymore. You can't insure the wine? It's cost prohibitive. Oh, yeah. everything is, isn't yeah. it? Okay, so you switched to labor law and, and, and you went to a different Palm Beach County law firm. Right, I, um, I interviewed as someone interested in labor law. I ended up working with a firm that represented uh, unions and workers. So I represented uh, police and firefighters, uh, a lot of individual workers, uh, and a lot of uh, the labor unions uh, in the construction trades. And that's also when you became director of the ACLU? Um, I was on the uh, ACLU board locally uh, shortly after law school. Uh, I was on their statewide board many years later but I got involved with the ACLU and you know, it's, it's a good fit for someone with my background. I would say it would be. Um, are you still involved with the ACLU? I'm a lifetime member of the ACLU. Uh, I send them checks on a regular basis and when I need help on something, they're one of the first uh, organizations that I call. Oh, nice, very good things. Um, somebody else did a lot of this research for me and person told me to ask you about your role in the 1988 presidential campaign of Governor Michael Dukakis. When I was in 
junior high school when we were working on the movement to lower the voting age, I actually got to meet a Mike Dukakis. He was a maverick in the state legislature, brilliant man, uh, was not going to just toe the line. He had better ways to do things. And um, he decided to uh, run for governor. I had been involved in a lot of statewide campaigns as, you know, the kid who's, you know, getting coffee for everybody, being in the room, listening while things happen. So uh, I got involved in his uh, campaign for governor. And when he decided to run for president, my folks called me up and they said, Mike's running for president. So I contacted the campaign, and uh, the next time that I was up in Boston, I stopped by, met their campaign treasurer, Bob Farmer, who was from Florida. This was very early stages. They hadn't even committed to do anything in Florida. And then when they decided to make Florida a priority, they had 10 people in the room, and I was one of them. And I had a great time with that because it fit in very well with the work that um, the unions were doing. And with the history of the firm, the unions used to cover their bases. And so some would work for this candidate, some would work for that candidate. So they all had representation at the national convention. And I knew how much the Dukakis campaign was going to be devoting uh, resources, time, money here in Florida. And I said, and I was a new lawyer there, I said, you got to trust me on this one. You've got to be in the Dukamp Dukakis camp. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting on the sideline. Um, and they went along with it, and it really worked well for them. The downside is, when it came to having a Cox to see who the Democratic uh, delegates to the convention would be, I was told, well, we appreciate your help, Rand, but you're not a union member, and we need to make sure that the union members uh, get to go. So I was on a slate with Lois Frankel and some other people. It wasn't an anti-union slate. It was a very pro-union slate, but it wasn't all union uh, members. And of course, my firm was supporting the slate that I wasn't on that had all of our clients on it. And then my boss said, you not only have to get off Lois's slate, uh, you basically have to denounce it and support you know, the union slate. I did not stay with that law firm much longer. Uh, the Dukakis campaign got me a slot and part of the Florida delegation, which I was very grateful uh, for. I was very happy to be able to cast my vote uh, for Mike Dukakis at the convention. But it was an interesting lesson. Um, and you just have to take everything into account. Yes. So, It, it did. It hurt, and it was on the front page of the papers. And um, a lot of the clients who were on the slate felt really bad for me, but this is the world of politics, and every, yes. this is a commodity to have you know, uh, your representation at the convention. Um, but I realized the law firm really wasn't putting my interests, I don't want to say at the top, they weren't considering them at all. So. Right. Yeah. But you, you started out talking about when you first were working with campaigners, different elections campaigns, and different issues. You got this look in your eye. And I, it must have been a very exciting time for a young man. It was great. I mean, the war in Vietnam was going on, and we were stopping it. There was a special election in Massachusetts in my congressional district because the, um, the, there were two congressmen, Congressman Bates and his son, Congressman Bates, who'd held the seat for years. Um, staunch Republicans in a district that was changing in a time where the war was really having an effect on everyone. So I spent a summer working, you know, calling uh, people on the phone, knocking on doors, doing all that, and it was great. And we were supporting a candidate by the name of uh, Michael Harrington, and very well-educated person, politically connected. And I can remember going to a rally, and my job was to help pass out balloons. You know, really high-level work that I was doing as a 
12 year old. And um, afterwards, we were back at the campaign headquarters and I got a chance to talk to Mike and he spoke to me just like he spoke to everybody else. He was passionate about ending the war. He realized this was one of the reasons I got involved. So I've been very fortunate with my political mentors and clients over the years because there's been a special connection there. Now that wasn't always the case. I went to um, Washington DC to go to school and I dropped out after uh, the first semester of my sophomore year to work on a national presidential campaign. And the candidate was uh, Senator Henry Jackson from Washington State, Scoop Jackson, and who clearly was not as far uh, on the progressive side of all of the issues as I was. Um, as a matter of fact, the day that he announced at the press club in Washington, D.C., I was the guy who got stuck behind at the headquarters while everybody was over there. And the now defunct, fortunately, Washington Star sent over a reporter to do a story as who's the person who gets stuck at the campaign headquarters when everyone else is over there. I hadn't dealt with the national press much at all. The guy said everything was off the record. And, you know, we talked a little bit about my background. And I think the quote was, I'm pretty liberal when it comes to defense issues, which is more than I can say for Scoop Jackson. So that appeared in the Washington Star the next day. And I got called in by my boss. I got sent over to the uh, senator's office to meet with um, uh, Richard Pearl, who was later known as the Prince of Darkness when he worked for the uh, Reagan administration. But he was the top foreign affairs person in Scoop's campaign. And fortunately, my boss said to me, look, it's great that this happened early on. You'll have a story to tell, but you don't talk to the media anymore with the exception of, would you like a press release? So I learned my lesson that the media sometimes isn't as honorable as it should be. And I learned when I was supposed to talk, when I was not supposed to talk. I learned off the record, deep background. Uh, and I ended up working on the campaign for a while. But at any point in time, the reason I chose Jackson is because he was not charismatic and needed to hire the most effective team in Washington, D.C. that could be assembled. And again, I was a fly in the room. I mean, I knew how to change the paper in the copy machine, fill the Coke machine. I was running errands back and forth. Eventually, I got to do some work in both media uh, and in uh, finance, but it was, it was a great experience. But I was in a lot of the rooms just absorbing things, which I put together later. I became a political consultant after that, doing some work with the same people who had uh, educated me. But since then, I've returned to, if I'm going to do some political work, it's got to be for someone who I believe can change the world. Because the world always needs a little bit tweaking here and there. It does that. It does that. Especially right now. Right. <clears throat> I wonder if we should talk about that now. Um, it's, I'm not surprised that you liked, that you liked politics. Um, have you run for any? Besides the judgeship? You are looking at an elected official. I ran for town meeting in uh, Swampscott, Massachusetts. Uh, when I got out of college, there were, I believe, 19 candidates for 18 slots. And the person who didn't get elected was the first candidate on the list. Now, New England has two types of uh, town meetings. One where everybody in the town gets to show up and speak and vote. And then we have what we had in my town was a representative town meeting. So you're actually elected for terms there. So I was a town meeting member uh, at age 20 something or other. So in Florida, we don't have these town meetings. What, what is a town meeting member do? Is he, does he act like a commissioner does? That well, no, they have, uh, the town has selectmen, which make uh, all of the big decisions, but on policy issues, people can come up and say you know, important things like, do we really need a sign on the beach that says you can't bring your dog? 
um, or expanding the schools to do all sorts of things. So it's, it's very great. It's true democracy, uh, whether it's representative or it's a, everybody shows up because you have an input on a true town. Our town was you know, three square miles, five beaches, which I liked, yes. uh, about 13,000 people, a uh, nice suburb. Uh, and it was good to be involved in something like that where people would be able to stand up and listen and it was very respectfully run. I believe they still are all these years later. But um, that was my first taste um, of, of electoral politics for me personally. I'd done a lot of work for other candidates. But I never really wanted to uh, run for anything else. I had done political consulting and I'd be there with dinner with a client and people would just come over and interrupt at dinner and they'd talk about potholes or something like this and elected officials back then at least couldn't say, I'm having dinner with a friend, I'm having dinner with family, can you call my office? Uh, and I'm sitting there going, this is not the life for me. Plus, being involved in the background, you can get a lot more accomplished if you're focused on single issues. And I go to county commission meetings, I go to city commission meetings all over uh, Palm Beach County. And I don't want to sit through hours and hours of zoning and all these other issues that come up. I just want to go in laser focused on my issues and then be able to leave. And with Florida, you know, if you're an elected official, you can't talk to other elected officials about something that's coming up before you because that's a violation of the Sunshine Laws. Whereas someone who lobbies, for lack of a better word, for changes, you can talk to everybody. Yes, you can. <laughs> the Sunshine Law is good in one respect and terrible in other respects, but you do get a lot done yeah. in the public eye. Um, some of these questions I have been handed are just a little odd to me. <laughs> I created the Palm Beach County Human Rights Council. That was in 1988. How did that come about? It was interesting because of what happened in 1977 in Miami-Dade County when they enacted a gay rights law and then Anita Bryant came in with her Save Our Children campaign and the voters struck down the law. Nothing happened of any significance in gay rights in Florida till basically the late 1980s. Uh, the elected officials didn't want to deal with it. The activists didn't want to deal with another loss. And a friend had started uh, a gay democratic club. There were several around Florida. And it was called the Atlantic Coast Democratic Club, or as we affectionately called it, ACDC. <laughs> so we got a little bit of fun with that. Yes. But it was all Democrats. Yes. The Congress passed a law about fair housing, which required everyone with a fair housing ordinance to change it so it could allow for 55 and over real estate communities. So as a lawyer, I'm sitting there going, okay, so they have to change this law. Maybe they can put in a few more words like sexual orientation. So I realized if we were going to do that, we couldn't do it as a partisan organization because the county commission was made up of Democrats and Republicans, and there weren't enough Democrats to get it passed. So um, I was talking it over with a friend of mine, and we decided we needed to create our own entity. So we came up with the Palm Beach County Human Rights Council. We purposely did not include the words uh, gay, or gay and lesbian. Had we done so, we would have had to keep changing the name as our outreach expanded. And we made no effort to let people know this was not a gay rights organization. It was obvious from day one, our organization was human rights because gay rights are human rights. So we founded that um, in 1988. We started interviewing candidates, endorsing candidates, and we developed a nice little voting block. And our people, we have educated them to just 
we're interviewing candidates. These are our recommendations. Please come out and vote. Get your friends and family to come out and vote. And in a lot of elections, when not too many people turn out, it makes a huge difference. So we realized, okay, we can do something. So in 1990, when the city, when the county commission was looking to change the um, uh, fair housing ordinance, we approached uh, the individual commissioners and we said, this is what we want to do. It's not controversial, it's happening all over the rest of the country but it hasn't happened here because of what Anita Bryant did. So this is clearly about discrimination. I told them my story about discrimination. And the Democrats and the Republicans realized that this is wrong and we can do something about it. So the request was, can we do it, uh, I don't wanna say privately, but quietly. So I said, sure, I'm a lawyer, I just want the law on the books. If you mess up with someone from my community, we want it to be illegal, we want to have uh, changes made, we want to have people have rights just like everyone else. So we started the campaign, and basically, we only needed to convince four out of seven people. We did not need to convince the public at large. When attempts had been made in Hillsborough County and in Broward County to get gay rights law, you know, the People involved in those wanted the hearts and minds of everybody. Um, and as a lawyer, like I said, I just needed four votes. The law uh, takes effect, and then we can work around everything else. So we did not do a huge public relations campaign. I had to keep people from other counties out of our county. They wanted to come and share their experiences uh, on the radio. Harry said, share them in your county. We're doing a different approach here. So uh, we did that, and it turned out we got more people to send. They were like telegrams, uh, but we were paying for them. They didn't go through Western Union to the county commission. There was more than they heard of by numbers from anything other than when they were building one of the landfills. So they realized that this was a popular thing. It was the right thing to do. and. We were pretty successful in keeping it below the radar until some reporter or columnist wrote something in one of the newspapers about uh, the county trying to uh, ban discrimination uh, against live-in lovers, which was an interesting approach because we were not actually going with that. So at the time, it was it instantly became a little bit more controversial than it should have been. When we were doing the legislation, people were focusing on the words sexual orientation. What they didn't notice because of the change in the law, the fines that were originally $500 if you wanted to discriminate against someone because they were Jewish or Catholic or black or whatever, you know, $500 is the cost of doing business, and you can keep your exclusive communities exclusive, meaning we exclude you people. Um, so people weren't noticing that, but they were noticing what we were trying to do there. The realtors got very upset because they were subject to this. The new fines were started off with $5,000, Second offense, 10,000, and third offense, 25,000. So it could really ruin your commission if you did this. And we kept telling people, you don't want to have a problem? Don't discriminate. Really easy. So the realtors wanted to put it on a referendum. Those had failed before in Florida. And the county commissioners didn't want this. They wanted to do the right thing. They had the power to do a law. They didn't want to spend all of this money and have all of this controversy just because they wanted to make sure that gay people were protected just like everyone else. So um, we did take to the media. We did discuss how civil rights should not be uh, decided by a vote of the majority of the population, which happens to be pretty white, pretty straight. So it should be done legislatively. So we got our ducks in line, and when we had the final hearing, 
we had more members of the clergy than they had. We had more realtors than they had. We had more small business people than they had. And I gave a speech, a lot of people gave speeches, but for those people who are uncomfortable, we had this huge list of jurisdictions that had already passed these laws. So everybody got about a minute or two to speak. We gave them the list, they went through, and they read the names of the, the cities and states and towns and counties, and it was very effective because all of a sudden it wasn't something radical. This was just bringing us to date with what happened in the rest of the world. So when the votes were counted, we enacted the first gay rights law in Florida that's still in effect. And shortly after, it was easy to get almost anything done because no one lost their seat as an elected official because they supported this. A lot of people realized that they had gay and lesbian people in their families and they should be protected just like everybody else. And it really wasn't that controversial at all. So from there we went to the municipalities saying, can you do this, can you do that? And everybody was very receptive. In West Palm Beach, they enacted an ordinance uh, to cover discrimination uh, in housing and public accommodations and in employment. And one of the commissioners, as soon as it passed, called for recall. She said, this thing has to be done. That was terrible. We want the people to vote on it. And as much as I personally thought that's the wrong idea, um, it turned out to be the right idea because 58% of the voters in West Palm Beach voted against the repeal. And we've never had a problem with the religious right until recently uh, since then. So from 1994 when that happened till you know, a couple of years ago, we really haven't had to take them into account. I understand that three weeks later, the Palm Beach County was the first public employer in Florida to amend a county's affirmative action plan to protect their gay and les lesbian county employees from discrimination in their workplace. Right, and it was totally non-controversial. It was done at a commission meeting. Again, they had the policy that was protecting gays and lesbians as residents. They, the least thing they could do is protect their own employees. Did you have any input in that? Oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, between 90 and 92 were very productive years. Were they due to your efforts? Was there well, I have a board of directors, um, so it's a collective group, although I'm the spokesperson that you see on television and in the media, and I think I may have told you this before, when I first was um, doing this, uh, my parents had moved down, and my mother was saying, oh, it's great what you're doing, but you have to be in the media so much. And I said, yeah, it's one of those things. So one day I was on the television, and the runner underneath said, it's a Rand Hawk homosexual. Not gay rights advocate or anything like that. So my mother, it's an la unusual last name. So my mother was somewhere, and uh, she was meeting someone new, and she was, oh, is your son the homosexual? <laughs> So we are educated, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, the only one. So uh, obviously we had to work a little bit with the media, letting them know that homosexual is a relatively technical term, but gay rights advocate is perfectly acceptable as well. And, and much broader meaning, right. yes, exactly. But during those years it was great because everybody wanted to go out of their way to protect the rights of gays and lesbians possibly because we have proven we were a significant voting bloc, and possibly because they realized what happened in the 70s with Anita Bryant was wrong, and Florida needed to change its reputation to what we had until recently as being very welcoming to everyone. And it took, I don't, I remember the Anita Bryant thing, I was old enough to remember it, uh, but I don't know exactly when that was. 19, it took from 1977 to 1990 to get a gay rights law. It's a long time. It is a very long time. And I, when I was in Washington, D.C. in uh, 1974, the first bill was introduced in Congress to add the word sexual orientation into the Civil Rights uh, Act. It's now 2023. 
those words are still not there. So this is not, right, this is really problematic, but we're working on it. We're that's, not giving up. That's all you can do is right. not give up. Did you have memorable disappointments during this period of time? Yes, the school board was a challenge. Um, that was out in California, the Briggs Amendment, which was trying to ban uh, gay and lesbian people from being teachers. I mean, even Ronald Reagan opposed that. But when it came to children between that and Anita Bryant, the school boards around the state were being overly concerned. They didn't want to do anything too controversial. They didn't want to lose their jobs as school board members. So um, Sandy Richmond, who just passed away, was one of our strongest advocates on the school board. But time after time after time, we could not get the school board to protect its LGBTQ plus teachers and administrators and employees, let alone the students. So that was uh, a really big disappointment uh, during that time. Did that ever change? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> How long did it take? Um, I remember we added uh, trans, uh, protection for the trans community in 2007. So it was probably 2001 or 2002 when we got sexual orientation so included that. And it's, we're not going away. Well, <laughs> we are very persistent and the elected officials know this, the media knows this. We've had setbacks and we just keep moving forward until we get what we need to protect our community. Big that year for me. Pretty big year for you. Can you tell us what happened to you in 1992? Well, I had, um, we had a governor by the name of uh, Bob Martinez. And when the AIDS crisis came to Florida, he came up with some great ideas like, why don't we just quarantine all of the homosexuals? This was a sitting governor. Uh, fortunately, Lois Frankel had been elected to office. She was the voice of reason. We got some good laws passed that were used as models everywhere else. But this was a man I did not want to continue in office. So I took time off out of my law firm uh, and I worked for Lawton Childs. Uh, no flaming liberal, but a very fair-minded person, great uh, statesman. And I helped to a small degree to turn things around here in Palm Beach County and the model that we used um, uh, was later used statewide and he got elected. So for years, having helped people get elected to office, uh, and asking for favors for friends, I noticed that they created three new uh, positions for judges of compensation claims. By that time, I was specializing in both election law and workers' compensation law, and these were three opportunities to become a judge. So I said, okay, I should apply. There were a hundred people applying for three positions. And what they did is you go in front of a statewide nominating committee and they interview you. And the committee back then was made of five plaintiff's lawyers, and I was a plaintiff's lawyer, five defense lawyers, and then five neutrals selected by the others. I had litigated against almost all of the defense lawyers. Um, I had a former boss who was one of the plaintiff's lawyers. And the others were lawyers I would call if I had an issue and I couldn't get a hold of my boss uh, just to brainstorm with them. And the neutrals included people that I had used as experts at trial. So I knew almost everybody on the committee. So there was a position in Tampa, one in Pensacola, uh, and one in Orlando. So they asked me, if we send your name up, which one would you like? And I said, so there were three newly created uh, judgeships, one in Orlando, one in Pensacola, and one in Tampa. And still being a beach bum, I figured the one in Tampa was the closest to both the beach and some culture. So when they asked me which position would I want to be sent up for, 
if I was sent up, I said the Tampa position. So what they ended up doing is. I'm so sorry, there were three, there okay. were three so, judgeships and you chose <coughs> Tampa, it was closest to the water. That's right. not very close to the water. Well, it, it's a lot closer than Orlando. Yes, it is. And I had lived in St. Pete before, so I was familiar with the area. So what happened was they selected nine of us. There were um, three white men for Pensacola, three white men for Orlando, and two white men and one one and one white woman, three, okay, I'll back up on that. So there were th three white men for the position in Orlando, three white men for the position in Pensacola, and two white men, including me, and a woman for the position in Tampa. Now, I had gone to school with the son of the person who served as general counsel to Governor Childs. And I called my friend and I said, you know, I'd be the first openly gay person as a judge in Florida. Does your father have any opinions about gay people? He said, my father doesn't think he's ever met a gay person. And he told me, he said, you should go up to Tallahassee, find a reason to go up uh, once the name's sent up, and just drop by the office, say you're a friend of Pete's, all this. So I did that. And... Um, the general counsel was Jay Peterson, good guy, a friend of Charles from way back. Um, and we had a great talk. And he said, you come highly recommended. And you know things are looking good. So I went over to Tampa. I opened a bank account. I opened up a post office box. I looked at real estate. And I'm just waiting because the appointments come down within about 30 days after the names are sent up there. So about two days beforehand, I get a call from the general counsel, and he said, Lawton was just speaking at Judges College. All the newly elected and appointed judges get some training, they call it Judges College. And he looked out over this field, and it was basically all white men. And Lawton wants to appoint as many women as judges as possible. And I said, Jay, there are certain sacrifices I'm prepared to make for Governor Childs, but that's not one of them. And he laughed, and he said, make sure you tell that story to the people on the Judicial Nominating Committee who want you to keep applying. There'll be another position by the water, and it would help. So I did not get the position, um, and the next time something opened up, it was in Daytona Beach. I previously lived there, I had a business there. Um, so I applied, and I had told this story to everybody I could. Fortunately, not many women applied for the position to begin with, but there were two extremely qualified local people, and me, who were sent up to the governor, and the two other nominees who would try cases in front of me for the next four years, were certain one of them was going to get the position. So when I got the position, uh, everyone was kind of surprised, like, who is this guy? And when it appeared in the papers down here in South Florida, it was, you know, gay activists appointed to the bench. In Daytona, it was South Floridian <laughs> appointed to the bench. And then a week later, uh, they mentioned the fact that, um, you know, I was Florida's first openly gay judge. But my being gay wasn't really a factor as much as I think I had worked hard and I had taken time out from my career to help the governor get elected. And I had sailed through the, um, the nominating process twice now. So uh, I got to go up to Daytona Beach and serve as a judge of compensation claims. And it was interesting, when I first started, you know, the attorneys came from all over central Florida. And it was, yeah, I'm going over to the gay judge. That didn't last very long when they realized the gay judge was just another judge. Yeah. So it was, there wasn't anything special. Uh, they all had to be prepared. And um, it was interesting to see how it worked out. For a lot of people, I think I was the 
first openly gay person that they knew, and someone for the lawyers, someone in their same profession. So that was kind of interesting, and a lot of them opened up about, you know, I think my daughter's gay, I think my son's gay. Um, and I said, look, I'm not an expert. I can tell you about myself and my experiences, but the message I have for you is treat them the same way, love them the same way, and everything's going to be fine. So that worked out great. And then something happened. There was a law firm in Central Florida, which at the time was the largest workers' compensation defense firm in the state of Florida. Risman, Weisberg, Barrett, two or three other named people in there. And they used to do these marketing seminars. If you could put three or four insurance adjusters together, they would send out their lawyers and say, we have the inside scoop on everybody the lawyers, the doctors, the judges, the mediators. And they would give this seminar, which they called Sleeping with the Enemy. There was a movie yes. called that back then. It had nothing to do with this. They just considered everybody who wasn't them the enemy. And in this seminar, they would say, this judge doesn't read the evidence. This judge doesn't like Haitians. This doctor will do whatever we tell him to do. You know, this in investigate this attorney's clients because they all have criminal backgrounds. And it was pretty disgusting to know this. I got notified by a few people that I knew in the insurance industry. They were saying, you know, the law firm is saying some bad things about you. And I just brushed it off. I mean, if they're going to say I'm gay, big deal. You know, I'm openly gay. Being gay isn't a bad thing. Um, but I didn't know any specifics about it. Well, after a trial ended and I had issued a final order and it wasn't appealed, I had an attorney approach me and said, have you heard what the Rissman firm is saying about you? I said, no, I heard it wasn't very good, but uh, and I really don't know the details about it and it doesn't make a difference. And he handed me a seven-page, single-spaced transcript of one of these. Apparently, one of the insurance adjusters had recorded the whole thing and gave it to someone who transcribed it. And in addition to all of those things that I mentioned about others, about me, they said, and this is the only thing that was in quotes in the entire seven pages, always send a young man before Judge Hawk as he prefers boys in shorts. So in one sentence, I was accused of both being a corrupt judge, and a pedophile. So needless to say, I, I was distraught. Uh, I have a judge who is a colleague who's openly gay. I said, i got to come down and talk to you about this. Uh, so I, the weekend I came down, I said, first of all, I want you to review all of your cases, and is there ever an instance of where you went with a cute, male lawyer as opposed to somebody else. And I kept a log of everything. I looked at it. And I said, not one. I said, I apply the facts. I apply the law. The decision comes out. That's it. If they don't like the decision, there's an appellate system. He said, fine. Um, he said, can you be fair with this law firm? And oddly enough, I mean, they were, they were very good before me. They won a lot of their cases before me. Um, without sending a young man in shorts. Yeah. Although they did have one partner who was just annoying, who they probably thought would be somebody I would be interested in romantically, and the guy was an idiot. Uh, and I, I actually called him and I said, please don't send this man, because if we go to motion hearing and I rule, and I rule against him, you don't get to argue anymore. You can file a, a writ of certiorari, you can file an appeal, but I don't need to listen to him because I have a whole motion calendar. And this guy was constantly doing that. So anyway, the attorney said to me, contact the lawyers and let them know, you know what they did was inappropriate and wrong. Offer to recuse yourself in the cases. Because when that document came out, one of the other judges in Central Florida got a copy of it. And he was accused of all sorts of things, 
inappropriate things. Um, and he knew they weren't true. He hated the law firm, so he basically went over to the Xerox machine, made hundreds of copies, sent them out to everybody in effect to damage the Risman law firm. So the Risman law firm was on, you know, trying to control the damage for a while. So, you know, I called them and I spoke to Steve Risman and he denied saying, and I said, well, don't say it again because it wasn't for a minute that I didn't believe his attorneys didn't do that. And I didn't know which attorneys had said whatever. Uh, they continued to appear in front of me. And I was involved, I was president of the Conference of Judges of Compensation Claims. We are administrative law judges, basically, which means we're part of the executive branch as opposed to being part of the independent judiciary. So the other officers and I were trying to get into the independent judiciary so we wouldn't uh, have pressure for re-election all these years. People wanted to keep their jobs, but uh, most of us just wanted to be independent and do our jobs. Um, so what happened was they started not reappointing people who were trying to keep the judiciary independent. So three or four judges were not reappointed. I believe I was the fourth one not to be reappointed. But I had been a mediator before. I figured I'd open up a private mediation practice, which I did. But I had this huge cloud hanging over me that a lot of people in the insurance industry thought that, you know, they had to send a cute young man before me or else they won't have a fair shot. So my friend the judge had told me, you know, don't sue or anything like that while I was in office, as long as I could be fair. And then when I was no longer holding the office and it was getting in the way of my doing business, he said, yeah, you probably want to do something. So I went over to Jack Scarola from Cersei Denny, Scarola, Barnhart and Shipley, who in my opinion at the time and still is the foremost lawyer when it comes for defamation cases. And I knew him a little bit. And I said, Jack, look, this is, this is what happened. And he goes, yeah, it's gonna be really hard to prove that they said this. I said, oh, I have a transcript. He says, you have a transcript? She looks at the transcript, presses a little button on the phone and said, will you please bring in a contract of representation for Judge Hawk? So um, he said, it's, it's an uphill battle, all this. There are about six or seven people who went to these seminars. These seminars were held. There were at least 24 seminars that we found. Hundreds of people were there. So I had heard from a few of them who kept contemporaneous notes. And the comments were right in there at different seminars. So what Jack did is he said, okay, give me a list of about 60, 70 insurance adjusters. We will depose every single one of them. And we know which ones have the notes. We may discover some other ones, but it will provide cover for everybody. And we went through, we tried to have the trial here and because we couldn't identify a seminar that was here, it ended up being held in Orlando where the law firm was based. And Jack said to me after a couple of hearings, he said, we're going to be hometown, which basically means they're based there, we're from here, the trial judge is just going to buy whatever they want. He said, so everything we do from now on is going to be based uh, on what we need to do to prepare for an appeal in front of a higher level of judges that will take a look at everything. So um, we lost on a motion for summary judgment, just like Jack said we would. And then we appealed to the Fifth District Court of Appeal, which is based in Daytona. I hired a, an appellate attorney that Jack recommended, really good guy, and he said to me on his way up to oral argument, he said, Rand, I'll call you afterwards, but I can't read the Fifth DCA at all. They're very staid, they don't let anything slip. You know, they're gonna do a great job on this, but I will not be able to tell you how everything went. I said, that's fine. So about four hours later, I get a call and he said, if they don't rule in your favor on everything, I will quit the practice of law. And I'm saying, oh, I'm feeling a little bit better. The law firm had hired a former president of the Florida Bar 
and the judges were questioning him unbelievably on you know, all of this, because it's, it's offensive that you do that, especially if you're a member of judiciary. Here's someone who had a really good but short career, uh, was you know, rarely overturned, good demeanor. Um, so the 5th DCA issued an order uh, basically setting aside the motion for summary judgment, saying you're gonna go forward to trial on this one, and really ripped one into this uh, firm. Big time. The firm was very upset, because this is a published order. And the lawyers get every week a list of published orders out there. So they asked for a rehearing. The rehearing order was worse for them than the first one. And so I'm sitting there going, great, everybody gets to read this twice about what a bunch of horrible people these attorneys were. So they uh, tried to get a review of the order from the Florida Supreme Court, and the Florida Supreme Court basically said, nah, we're sticking with the two orders from the 5th DCA. At that point in time, um, I could either proceed to trial or you know, do settlement negotiations. Then 9-11 happened. So people were dying. And I had been called names. So in the whole scheme of things, in discussions with Jack, he said, probably not the best time to go to trial on this. Um, people's minds are all over the place. And what you have suffered is minor compared to what's going on in the world today. And I learned as an attorney, you want your clients to accept your advice. And I was a client this time. I accepted Jack's advice. And um, he negotiated a settlement. And I can only say under the terms of the settlement that they paid me, quote, a substantial amount of money, end quote. And the only people who know that are my accountant, my parents, me, and you know, all of the people who had to have their insurance companies cough up the money. So that was you know, sort of a, a low point for a long time for me, because it takes a long time for this thing to go through. I'd returned to Palm Beach County under a cloud. My successor at the Palm Beach County Human Rights Council, who I hand-selected, didn't want to have anything to do with me because I was under a cloud. So I could not do a lot of the local advocacy that I wanted to do, especially since we still didn't get the school board to do everything. So it was a, it was a difficult time for me, but eventually things worked out. So it took about five years to work its way through the system. Yeah. Wow. I was gonna say, is there something that they should do differently that it shouldn't take so long to get through the system? Well, I mean, we need more judges. We need more judicial assistants. Uh, we need less frivolous lawsuits, but I don't see Florida doing the right thing when it comes to helping plaintiffs get through the system quicker. But the judges are overworked unbelievably here in the state. It's underfunded, and it's, it's a big problem. No one should have to wait that long. And again, they called me names. You know, it wasn't like I was paralyzed and I couldn't get medical help. In the big scheme of things, uh, while it impacted me personally, I was still able to function. I couldn't do everything that I wanted to do in life, but you know, things happen. You couldn't do the job you wanted to do. Well, the volunteer work that I wanted to do. I was able to mediate, um, but they, they could have nipped this in the bud by sending out a letter to all of the people who had gone to their seminars that said, we made a mistake, we apologize, and that would have ended everything. They clearly underestimated who Jack Scarola is. They had no clue. I'm almost to the point of where I say to you, is there anything that we have not discussed that you would want to make sure is on tape for the future? But I also want to know how your folks reacted when you told them uh, it, it's funny. Um, my parents should have had no clue to think anything other than that. 
Uh, I wasn't effeminate, but I wasn't into sports. I wasn't dating women. Um, and they're smart, educated people. Um, I have a couple of cousins who one might suspect. But what I decided to do is I was going to be in their face. So when I was up in Massachusetts, I was very discreet. And when I moved to Florida, you know, it was just like openly gay man, here I am. But I decided, you know, I had been a beach bum for five years, so they're not exactly overly proud of my um, decisions when it comes to my career. So I decided after my first semester of law school, where I did very well, top 10% of my class, is that I should come out to my parents. My timing was not that great. Um, Barney Frank, who was a congressman from Massachusetts, had just got basically outed. He had uh, someone living, his, his boyfriend living in the apartment, apparently uh, involved in commercial sex with people in Washington, D.C. Um, so that was all over the papers in Boston. My parents are relatively conservative people to begin with. So I go back home determined to tell my folks over the dinner table, by the way, doing well in law school, and I happen to be gay. And I get up there, and my mother is just talking. She loved Barney Frank uh, about all of the stuff going on and how could he do that to his mother. <laughs> all, all sorts of stuff that comes up there. So I'm figuring, okay, this is not going to work out as I had planned. So I had prepared for this. I had read a book, and it said, if you're going to come out to your family, don't do it at home. Do it at some place where nobody's ever been before, so there will be no constant reminder if it goes down badly. So I said to my dad, let's have uh, lunch. He worked in Boston. I'll meet you in Boston. Uh, and he says, there's a new place that opened up by the office. I said, perfect. So get there for lunch, and we're talking. And so like a day or two before I'm heading back to law school. And my older brothers were married with children by then. So I said, you know, mom's taking this thing about Barney Frank really Seriously, really hard. He goes, yeah, your mother's very conservative. I said, how do you think she'd feel knowing that one of her sons is gay? My father's going, oh. <laughs> First words out of his mouth, I love you, which I don't know if he'd ever told me before. Second phrase was, are you seeing anybody? I said, no. He said, good, don't tell your mother. <laughs> Until you're involved with a relationship, don't tell your mother. I said, why? He said, you are going back to Florida. I'm staying here. I'm going to have to put up with this. I'm not educated or prepared to deal with this. So until such time as you have something special to tell us about your future and your partner, let's just keep it between the two of us. So I honored my father's wishes. So about a semester later, I'm on my way to bankruptcy class. The bankruptcy professor was a judge. If you didn't show up, you were locked out of class. And he had a thick Hungarian accent, so you had to be there, listen to what he said, and then compare notes with other people to make sure you got everything right. So the phone rings. That's my mom. And she said, your father told me that if I ask you a question, you'll tell me the truth. So I knew it was coming. And I assumed they had this conversation. So she asked me, are you gay? I said, yes, I am. And she started with, oh, my God, oh, my God. Uh, I said, Mom, I can't handle this right now because I have a very important class. And um, we'll deal with this later. I get a call from my dad the following morning. And my dad generally just doesn't pick up the phone to chat. So when... I hear my dad's voice suddenly going, okay, we got a problem here. He said, I thought we had an understanding. I said, we did, but mom told me that you told her. And he said, your mother lied. My father had never said an ill word about my mother 
my entire life. He said, like I told you before, I'm not prepared to handle this, so you get your ass on a plane right away so we can deal with this. I told him, I've got exams coming up. He said, what are the days of your exams? He told me, okay, day after your last exam, you're on a plane, you're going to be up here, you have to deal with this. Um, I said, okay. So I went to a bookstore and I found a book called Loving Someone Gay and I FedExed it up to her. I found a hotline for gay people, and relatives, etc., in the, the community where my parents lived. Gave my mother the, um, the phone number of that and was trying to get through exams. So I get up there. The hotline did not work out well. Apparently, the guy who was answering the phone when my mother called wasn't out to his parents. So that was not a good, <laughs> a good resource up there. She did not like the book. Um, so it was one of these things, you know, they were concerned about AIDS. I had to explain, you know, gay people and AIDS, it, they don't equate. You know, it's a totally different situation. And back then, you know, this is 84, 85, you know, we didn't know that much about AIDS at all. So it got to the stage where my mother says, well, you have to stop. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. It's like, this is who I am. It's who I've always been. And I'm sorry if it makes you feel uncomfortable, but you know, I'm not only gay, but I'm advocating for the laws to be changed. And this is four years before PBC HRC, but I was working with a group called the Florida Task Force, uh, which was to maintain a lobbyist in, in Tallahassee. So I gave her an ultimatum. I said, look, you know, this can be our last conversation ever, or you can educate yourself. But I'm an adult. This is who I am. I'm not doing anything wrong. And, you know, you're going to have to make a decision about this. And eventually, they came around. I mean, coming to Florida and having somebody say, oh, your son's the homosexual, <laughs> didn't really help. But when I got sworn in as a judge, I had a huge investiture. And I had been involved with representing the firefighters and the police and construction workers, so the bunch of them there. I've been chair of the Democratic Party, so the bunch of you know, Democratic you know, officials and activists there, and a whole bunch of gay people from around the state of Florida. And it was a fascinating experience <laughs> seeing how everyone was interacting. But uh, you know, my mom went from do you have to be this open about it to like cutting out articles in the newspapers and sending them to relatives up north saying, look what Rand is doing, look what he's becoming. So that's my little gay pride story for my mom is once she got comfortable with it and knew there was nothing she could do and there was nothing wrong with being gay, she, she embraced it. So we need to talk about conversion therapy though. Do we? Yeah, because we just got screwed. Because we, we just got screwed by the courts. Okay. So, All right. um, so over the years, I mean, we've passed uh, over 150 laws here in Palm Beach County okay. uh, to protect the rights of LGBTQ plus people, uh, to make sure we have equal protections, equal benefits. During the course of the years that I've been involved, every now and then, I'd get calls from kids because my name's in the paper, the Back then we had phone books. Right. <laughs> um, they could right. find me relatively easy. And um, they were being forced by their parents to go to these counselors and church leaders to try and change them from being gay or lesbian to being what their parents would refer to as normal. Now, I'm not trained in psychology. I really don't have the skills. I can listen to them. Uh, but you can't tell a nine-year-old you need to go see a psychologist because they have no way to get there. There weren't programs in the school. There weren't people that they could talk to. The anonymous gay activist on the phone, they could, they could do that to. And it really disturbed me that we couldn't help. And then an attorney uh, from Miami Beach got the city to 
ban conversion therapy through an ordinance. And it only covered licensed therapists, but it's a start. You know, you can't change everything at once. So I contacted some of the elected officials here, and they were familiar with the harms that conversion therapy can do. I mean, you take a 10 or 11-year-old kid and you send them to a therapist every week who tells them that they're never going to have a family, they're never going to be loved, they're going to be reviled. I mean, these are just words, but they are mean words repeated over and over to a child. So we have got great support from the elected officials here. We passed eight municipal ordinances and the county passed an ordinance prohibiting licensed uh, therapists and doctors from doing conversion therapy, which I firmly believe is child abuse. It's verbal, but it's child abuse. So we got those passed and city of Tampa got one passed and I had written the law here, which I'd sent over them, so it's, it's identical. So this right-wing Christian group, the Liberty Council, um, challenged it and they won in federal court with a Trump appointee over there. Very poorly written order, but you know, that was passed. And I figured they're not gonna do it twice. They already got an opinion in Florida. Well, they filed suit against the city of Boca Raton and Palm Beach County. What happened was there was a, they tried to get an injunction so the law couldn't take effect because you know, once the county commission passed it, you, know, you couldn't do this without being fined. So they went to formal hearing, presented evidence in front of a, a federal district court judge who issued a brilliant 60 page order explaining why this is not a violation of the First Amendment this is something out there to protect children. There's plenty of research out there saying that can, you can't change someone's sexual orientation. You can't do any of this. And it causes harm all the way up to suicide. And LGBTQ children are among the highest suicide groups out there. And within 30 days of that order came, coming out, Liberty Council you know, appealed the decision here and in Boca Raton and it went to the 11th Circuit. Now the 11th Circuit is what us civil rights lawyers like to say is where civil rights go to die. And the 11th Circuit, at the time there were six Trump appointees out of the panel of 12. There was just like two or three Democrats. The panel that we got, three judges, which heard the appeal, was two tr relatively new Trump appointees and an Obama appointee. And the decision was two to one. So the law was struck down. So the bans were no good anymore and these people could continue to discriminate uh, and treat children this way. So we filed a motion for rehearing. We wanted the whole court to take a look at this, all 12, now, we knew we would probably lose again, but we had nothing to lose by doing that. And it took them over a year to just rubber stamp the other opinion. A week after they did that, the Washington State, or Federal Court in Washington State, came out with a decision like all of the others that says, no, protecting children from this proven harm is something that we do as courts, and there's no First Amendment argument that works. So Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, the three states covered by the 11th Circuit, the only places where conversion therapy bans have been overturned. And it's, it's unfortunate because they want to get this issue before the United States Supreme Court with the current makeup of the court. So while we could have challenged the decision of the 11th Circuit, to the United States Supreme Court. If we did that and lost, then throughout the country, all of the conversion therapy bans would fall. So we have to 
do something very difficult for us, having worked for two years, getting dozens of people involved testifying at these hearings, we had to ask the elected officials to repeal the bans because we didn't want any other taxpayer entity to have to deal with the expenses and everything going on here. So, you know, until something happens, and I'm not seeing anything beneficial happening, conversion therapy will remain legal in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. So, so I do have a follow-up question on that. Just because they say that this is not allowed, that it is against the law, parent sends a kid for therapy anyway, who does the child report it to? Child can report it to whoever the governing body is. They could, like, they could report it to the county or the city or wherever they're in. As an eight or nine or ten-year-old child, they're not going to know who to go to. Well, the interesting thing is these kids who are gay have friends who are gay who have parents who are supportive. And that's where it comes in. But it's very difficult. I mean, some of these kids are being thrown out of their houses and they're moving in with you know, the, their friends' families. Um, and that's where, that's where it, it would go to. Um, but right now, does not much. No. And, it, and it's, it's still happening. I mean, I had, I had one kid call me about four or five times over the course of maybe six months. And when the calls stopped, I was a mess. I assumed the kid killed himself. No, I didn't know the kid's name. Oh. No. But, yeah. And when did that happen? What's the timeline on that? Um, with, with the, those calls coming in was before we actually were able to do something. So that would have been probably 2014, 2015. And the latest batch of legislation or well, I mean, like I said, the, the case came down, I think, in December here, saying, you know, too bad Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and Washington State at the same time. And, then, and Washington State is saying? Well, like every, it's, it's, it's the whole district over there. They're all saying the same thing. It's okay for a municipality to ban this type of child abuse. Yes. It's been upheld everywhere. This case that we have here the case in Tampa at the district court level and the appellate court level in the 11th Circuit, those are outliers. They are totally unsupportable by the law. But we have a United States Supreme Court that just decided 50 years worth of women's rights to control their own bodies should now be left to the states. Yeah. So it, it, is, it is unfortunate. And we don't want to take the risk. I had to explain to the staff at Compass. They didn't understand why we're asking the municipalities to repeal these laws. And I said, because there are 47 other states. Right. So we can't be selfish here. Right. We are falling on the swords. We're doing this. We hate it. But there's more to what's going on to children across the country than our three states. Yeah. No, um, what time is it? 444. Okay. Still time to get happy hour. <laughs> There's happy hour, oyster happy hour I'm going to with friends over oh, at okay. PB Catch. Okay. Oh, very good. <laughs> so. How did your brothers take the news of your lifestyle? It was funny. Um, and I object to the word lifestyle okay. because it's my life. It's not it's my lifestyle. Um, one of my brothers, an academic, didn't make a difference to him at all. The other brother was an interesting story. I have a lot of interesting stories. Um, when I graduated from law school, I got a URL pass, went to Europe, had a great time. And during that time, my uh, brother had remarried. His first wife had passed away. So he said, come on you know, meet Susan, so detour your trip back to Florida through here so I could meet my um, new sister-in-law and her two kids. So a movie came out called An Early Frost, 
It was a television movie, and it was about um, one of the first movies about you know, people with AIDS. And in one of the scenes, uh, the kid has to come out to his father that he's both gay and he's dying of AIDS. So my new sister-in-law figured out immediately, ran gay. She was in the you know, fashion industry, wasn't a big thing. My brother was very conservative, like my parents, just right over his head. So I just sort of, so um, Susan asked him, you know, what'd you think of the movie? And he said, well, you know, it was pretty well, it was pretty strong, but I can only imagine how the father felt finding out in one sentence that his son is gay and dying of AIDS. So I just file that in the back of my mind. My parents had both asked me not to come out to my brothers or anybody else in the family. This was before they, you know, this was many years before they became more comfortable with it. So um, I decided I was going to come out to my brother. Um, so I went to a restaurant that he'd never been to, <laughs> Pattern Works, and we're sitting there over dinner and catching up and everything. And I said, do you remember when I came home from Europe so I could meet Susan and the kids, uh, that we watched this movie called An Early Frost? He goes, no, not really. And Susan said, you remember that. It's about you know the guy who uh, was gay and got AIDS and had to deal with the whole family thing. He goes, oh yeah, I remember that. It's a good movie. And he said, something stuck in my mind. And he said, what was that? I said, well, you said how difficult it must have been for the father to find out in one sentence that his son is gay and dying of AIDS. Because yeah, that's a lot to take. So he said, Dave, I'm not dying of AIDS. Oh. oh. <laughs> so he made some you know, remarks like, don't share Cokes with the kids or anything like this. I'm not going to argue with them. You know, fine, whatever you want. And then he called up about a week later going, so how much of an idiot did I sound like? And I said, pretty much of an idiot, but obviously you've done some homework. He says, yeah, he's done some homework, but still don't share Cokes with the kids. <laughs> so so that's, uh, that's coming out to them. When I came out to my father, the next day, we're sitting in the den. He says, got to ask you. I said, go, go right ahead. He named 10 people, all men, friends of mine, cousins of mine, friends of my um, brothers. He got 10 out of 10. They're all gay. <laughs> my dad apparently had a great sense of gaydar. <laughs> so... I thought that was kind of interesting. Did you think that your dad may have had um, a side to him? Well, let me put it this way. I think if times were different, I may not be here for the interview. Uh, yes, I, I so. said that that way. Sounds like he would have been an interesting man to know. He was a very interesting guy. Yes, yes. So. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Sorry we were a little late connecting. Well. Um, but I, I really appreciate your time. Being so free and easy with 